So now I'm really uh, very pleased to introduce our first keynote speaker, Henrik Plate from SAP. Uh, Henrik is a senior researcher at SAP and uh, his current research is focused on security and software supply chain, especially the use of open source components. Uh, Henry, uh, Henrik is uh, leading the uh, Eclipse Speedy, uh, Steady, sorry, project, which support detection, assessment, and mitigation of vulnerable open source de dependencies. Uh, dear Henrik, the floor is yours. So yeah, um, good, good afternoon again. My name is Henrik Platen. I work for the uh, security research team of SAP, and uh, this talk will be about uh, yeah, cobbles and potholes, which are rather lame, uh, which is a lame metaphor for the kind of problems that we challenge these days when it comes to securing our software supply chain. Uh, before starting the presentation, I'd like to use the opportunity to, to sincerely thank the organizers for having me. I really feel honored to, for the opportunity to open this conference. All right. Um, so this is how the agenda, how we will run this, uh, this meeting. I will start with a very brief introduction of myself and a few words about my employer and the security research team. And then we will spend most of the time on what I believe are the two main problems that we see in the space of open source supply chain. The one known for quite some time, especially since Heartfleet in 2014, which is the, um, the use of components with known vulnerabilities. And the second, a problem that is, well, theoretically known since a long time as well, but uh, which, go, which gained quite some um, attention in the last couple of months, few years, and which is gaining much more attention in the future, which is my sad prediction. Quick, two quick disclaimers. Um, first, regarding the level of detail. So as always, when preparing presentations, I've been carried away by my passion and enthusiasm for the topic. So I put a lot of content, examples and references. Um, my excuse is that I wanted to produce a self-contained slide deck that is useful even after the presentation. So that people can refer to it, find the pointers, references, information. But of course, it requires quite some discipline for me to not explain every little detail and some discipline from the audience to not read all what is on those slides, but rather listen to me. In any case, for, you can always reach out to me after the presentation in case you have any questions regarding my whatever I presented. The second disclaimer is regarding this, this fear mongering. And this is kind of a problem inherent to the whole security domain, right? It's always like as if we find pleasure in making people afraid of security risks and vulnerabilities and so forth. I try to stay away um, by quoting and presenting information from research papers and studies that have been hopefully produced by independent researchers. Um, let's see whether this worked out. I leave that assessment to you. So very quick, I'm German, as you hear from my accent, 46 years old, and I spent quite a good share of my life in France. I developed software for many years already, and um, rather accidentally, I became a member of the security research team at SAP Labs in Southern France. Uh, and uh, that was actually a great Great accident, and I'm, I'm working happily working in this domain for more than 10 years, where I did architecture, code reviews, developed some secure developer trainings, uh, acted as European pro as, the, as the coordinator of European projects, and so forth. Sadly, I contributed far too little to the open source community. Uh, so shame on me. I try my best to catch up, particularly with Eclipse Steady. And I'm a cycling enthusiast, uh, which is explaining this metaphor and the occasional appearance of some cycling related pictures in my slides. Um, and so those, those pictures come from this infamous one day race, Paris Roubaix, which is actually known for its uh, cobbled or cobbled roads in Belgium. 
SAP and open source, well, is this, how does this fit together? Um, I would say not very much if you think of the software that we developed 20 years ago. And here's a screenshot of the infamous travel expense, man travel expense management solution. Maybe many of you have seen this bluish, uh, unintuitive um, UI. That was really all 100% closed sourced communication protocols, programming languages, IDE, and so forth. Um, that situation changed dramatically, drastically, as for the entire software industry, I would say. By now, we are a heavy consumer of open source, but we also try to give back, so we contribute to existing projects and we release and start new open source projects by, us, by ourselves. One particular noteworthy example in, in the year 2020 is this Corona One app. Um, so this is basically tracking um, yeah, uh, relationships between people using um, some decentralized data store storage. It has been in, uh, developed with a couple of other companies in a rather short time frame of 50 days and is now available on GitHub as well. Um, for what concerns SAP security, we consider ourselves being an applied research team, bridging academia on the one hand side and SAP product development on the other side. So we basically try to transfer and communicate uh, new approaches, concepts, tools from academia to a product development and see what is applicable and useful. useful and we try to communicate real world security problems to the academia and see where there is a fit. We have been quite successful in terms of peer reviewed publications. Um, and we have eight strategic research areas. Um, I'm not going into those or the majority of those. One is, um, one area is open source security analysis led by myself. And um, you will hear a lot about our work and current trends in this domain later on in my presentation. And the other topic of relevance is Secure Internet of Things, which is led by a colleague uh, named Laurent Gomez. And uh, for that topic, I spent one dedicated slide to uh, exemplify the work we are doing in the area of secure IoT. The first interesting observation when talking with Laurent a couple of days ago was that he would actually not call the secure internet of things anymore, but he would call it distributed enterprise systems. And this change in the name is reflecting a trend where those things are not any dump uh, devices any longer that collect data and send this to some central backend, but they become smarter and smarter such that um, programming logic and data is moving from the central enterprise systems to those devices, which brings its own new challenges. Um, this shift or this trend is also exemplified with two of the areas of work of Laurent and, and his colleagues. Um, in former times, they were working more on uh, secure end-to-end -end communication channel channels where the problem was really getting data in a secure way to backend. And uh, a good paper in this domain is the one I cited here, where he was basically developing a, a cryptographic scheme to uh, protect the confidentiality of the data being transmitted end to end. End to end meaning the data is encrypted on the device like sensor data and stays in an encrypted fashion in the database and decryption only happens shortly before any processing or display. Um, there were a couple of requirements like um, uh, device specific keys to support authentication, uh, frequent key changes, uh, and a couple of more. This solution is now uh, used in the water distribution uh, system of, of the city of Antibes in Southern France where basically uh, sensor data like temperature, water pressure, water levels and so forth are sent to some analytics backend uh, and then presented and analyzed um, yeah, with some dashboard. 
The second example is of a paper I wanted to cite relates to um, yeah, uh, where problems appearing when you move application logic and data to those devices. Here he was recently working on basically prote especially protecting um, the intellectual property of machine learning models that are deployed on the device and at the same time protect the input and output data. Um, and what he did basically is he was using um, homomorphic encryption in order to uh, protect the, the weights and the biases of the layers of the neural network and um, in order to uh, protect the model. Um, and which was working over the encrypted input data, uh, which was in the evaluation phase encrypted video data. And so the, the use case of this technology is to uh, basically protect or use video, the data of video cameras deployed in ONTEEP again, uh, in order to find out whether uh, there are any suspicious um, activities that could relate to terrorist attacks. So for example, if there are lorries or trucks being parked for a long time in front of some critical buildings or so forth. Um, right. Now we come to the two main uh, sections. Uh, the first one being dependencies with known vulnerabilities. So I will start assuming that we all agree on the fact that there are that open source consumption open source consumption is steadily increasing, and so is the number of disclosed vulnerabilities in such components. Um, one number in this context is. Uh, that typically an application uh, contains round about 100 dependencies or uh, upstream projects. Um, and a good percentage of those have known vulnerabilities or have, are, are let's say, are subject to, to vulnerabilities. And, and what happened is that in, I would say, with latest in 2014 with Heartbleed and even more so in 2017 with Equifax, developers entered kind of a hamster wheel, which is an endless cycle of checking whether there are new vulnerabilities for the components that you depend on. For every finding, try to figure out whether these are false positive findings, if not assess whether those vulnerabilities really matter in the specific context of your application, because maybe they're a part of some code that is not invocable, not reachable in the context of your application. And of course, you need to keep fingers crossed that your checks didn't have any false negatives. Next part of the, the hamster wheel is the mitigation, which can be very easy if your upstream users respect SEMware, and which can be very difficult in case you uh, of vulnerabilities of projects which are long dead and that you need to fix maybe in your own fork. And then uh, you release a patch, you're happy, or congrat congratulations to all people running software in the cloud. That is easy, that is really an advantage of cloud computing. And sorry for all those that need to patch software that is running in devices. So there was this Ripple 20 vulnerability a couple of months back, and this really exemplified the kind of the scale of the problem in this IoT domain, domain where you had this vulnerable TCP stack uh, that existed in uh, hundreds of thousands of devices. Many of them are actually unknown. And for some, you, you cannot even fix and release a patch to this device, even if you find and identify the device. So in this context of the hamster wheel of this endless cycle, we will talk about the following, the next 10 minutes about the following topics, quality, timeless, and content of public vulnerability databases problems for developers to assess such vulnerabilities, the shortened response windows, which are shortened in particular because exploits become available on a very quick basis. And last, a few notes and comments on the possibilities to auto upgrade, uh, to auto, to self, to self healing, if you wish, of vulnerable dependencies. So as a foundation of of, of, of what is important for the next few slides is to understand the CVE and NBD concept. 
whenever you talk about known vulnerabilities, you hear those terms in the first 30 seconds, I assume. Uh, this is the by now the largest publicly uh, available database with information about software vulnerabilities, both in open source software and commercial software and operating systems. And uh, basically everybody could submit uh, a CVE. So uh, basically whenever you a security learns about the vulnerability, he would request a CVE from the Mitre, an organization in the US. They would reserve a number, then start the discussions with the vendor and the researcher and so forth until it is eventually published uh, in the NVD, which adds uh, a severity rating and a number uh, of or an enumeration of the affected products. This whole process can take a few days up to several years, which is already indicating one of the problems we will be talking about later on. By now, there are 140,000 something CV entries as of yesterday. This is an example of a vulnerability reported for Eclipse Mojara, one of the uh, Java Enterprise components, if I'm not mistaken, handed over to the Eclipse Foundation some, some, some years back. Uh, and this is really almost, this is the full entry, right? You have a very short description, a severity rating saying this is a high, bigger problem. I uh, got a base score of 7.5. You have one reference to the fix commit and one to the issue. And you see this affected product is Eclipse Mojara. This looks neat, and, but it is by far not sufficient to let developers, downstream users of Mojara decide whether this vulnerability is really matters. Um, and there are many problems and I don't have the time to go through all of them. I just want to point to two. First of all, since this is a manual process, there are errors. Uh, unavoided, so no way to avoid those. And so one thing is they actually identified the wrong versions in the first place. So in fact, the versions 2.3.5 and 2.3.6 were also yeah. affected. And they corrected this after we reported this problem, uh, which we actually detected using Eclipse Steady. The second big problem is that their entire ecosystem is not covered like NPM. You will find very, very few vulnerabilities about Node JS packages or NPM packages. And there are many more, uh, mostly relying on the fact that you have humans involved in the process that give arbitrary names or labels to things that need to be mapped to other things. But I, I won't go into this here. This was an example. There are very interesting empirical studies of the inconsistencies in the NPD. So those researchers referenced here they basically compared um, almost 80,000 CVEs with 70,000 vulnerability reports produced over the last 20 years and tried to find inconsistencies in the names of the products and the versions of the products being referenced. And so they say the strict matching is if the CVE and the report is mentioning the same product names and the same product versions. Loose matching is if they match the same, they talk about the same product, but different ranges of versions. And when looking at it, and, and if you talk about different version ranges, basically one is overclaiming and the other one is underclaiming the number of affected products, right? Or product versions. And when they did this, they figured out just by comparing CDE and NVD that only 70% of those really have a strict match talking about the same affected product versions. 90% of uh, those uh, CVE, NVD entries talk about the same products, but about different versions. And the consequence of that is in 10% of the cases, they cannot even agree on the number of the products being affected. And it is, this is getting worse if you compare NVD to other information uh, vulnerability reports uh, like the exploit database and so forth. And uh, an important problem is related to response windows and uh, the availability of exploit. So here the, prob the main problem is um, that the time between a researcher reports a problem and until the description got, gets available to the general public is can spend weeks and weeks. They analyzed that difference, uh, finding uh, that quite a number of CV entries lag behind, one week behind the first 
uh, official public report. And the second problem, or why this matters so much, is because of a study regarding the availability of automated exploits. So here, Palo Alto Networks looked at 100 uh, at 11,000 exploits, so readily downloadable exploits from the EDB, and checked when those exploits were available compared to when the patches from the product vendors were available. And they figured out that 80% of the exploits that people can find on EDB were available before the CVEs were published, which is uh, which is quite alarming, I must say. Equifax is a particular case. Here, there were three days between patch availability and the actual data breach happening on March 10th, um, which is yeah an interesting time. So I think the consequences here are twofold. One is the the severe problems of the data quality and timeliness of public uh, vulnerability databases and the second is due to those small uh, response windows automation is really a must there are two approaches to to detect vulnerabilities one is on metadata where you basically compare those labels and a good example so labels giving to software components and labels giving to being given to vulnerabilities and you try to see whether there is a match, but that is fuzzy because it's human provided names. One example is the OVASP dependency check. They do surprisingly well. They are considering this fuzzy mapping. They are very lightweight and map against CVE and NVD. The second approach is code base where you ignore all metadata and only assume that real truth is in the coding. So here we have a method uh, and from that is has been identified by the fix commit. So this is the method fixed by the developers of, I think this was some Apache project. And you, you find vulnerable codes only by looking at or searching for this method and checking whether this is in the vulnerable or in the fixed state. And this code-based approaches outperform metadata-based approaches in terms of precision and recall and allow for nice features such as impact assessments and update metrics. So here you see a call graph from application methods to the vulnerable method I was showing before. Um, then um, one other important topic I find is and this is a shameless plug for a session we will be giving at EclipseCon in one or two weeks. The thing is that there is no high quality code level information publicly available. NVD falls short, as we have seen before. And what happened is that the providers stepped in and they started to build proprietary databases about vulnerabilities in open source software. Um, that mining of information is labor intense, um, despite some, some, some advances in AI-based commit classification. But this leads to the kind of paradoxical consequence that the, the, the information about open source components itself is not open. And because that data is not open, the general, the open source community cannot really develop proper tooling to, sell, to solve the security problem by themselves. They rely on basically the proprietary tool vendors to, 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 to share this data, which they do admittedly to be fair, but they do this drop by drop. You don't have access to the whole data set. And as all the, the machine learning AI guys can tell, that is what you would need in order to, to really work and progress in the area. Our approach to this is what, we call it rather clumsily project KB, which is meant to overcome this and which is basically a, a tool in a database to support distributed collaborative uh, management of vulnerability information for open source components. The next uh, is next topic relates to, I mean, you, you can say getting out of this hamster wheel automation is, is key. I think this is rather obvious. And what you should really do is to scan early, often, and automate it uh, with the tools I was mentioning before, OVAS, dependency, steady. There are also NPM audits. So every ecosystem has kind of its tooling. And on top of that, you have the commercial vendors, of course. But they only go as far as to, to the detection of the vulnerability, co vulnerable component. And the fixing, this is really left mostly to the developers. There are some 
tools that create automated pull requests for issues that they find in Git repositories. And this study I was mentioning here uh, proved or showed that um, projects using this automated pull request indeed patch more often, are more secure than the baseline, but still a lot of vulnerability uh, and a lot of dependencies and pull requests are not merged because the developers are afraid of breaking changes. And the root cause of this problem is the, the wrong use of SEMVR. Theoretically, SEMVR is great, so it gives you the possibility or you, you can rely on, if it is properly used, you can rely on minor and patch versions not introducing any backward incompatible changes or breaking changes. But there are some several studies that show that SEMVR is not properly used and even minor and patch releases uh, contain a whole bunch of backwards incompatible changes. And so this really has to improve before you can, before applications can become automatically fixed. The takeaways of this uh, first, talk, uh, first part on known vulnerabilities is CVE NVD has high, has problems with quality, timeliness and coverage. So you should really not use this as your only source of information, you or your tools you will miss something and you will be late. Um, this is not a blame important on NVD or CVE uh, because they do their best, but they are heavily underfunded. So the blame goes to the lack of appropriate support and funding to build such a public high quality database. And, and it was important that commercial vendors stepped in, but I strongly believe that the open source community should solve this problem by itself and that requires a public database. And these are the two other takeaways of that part. Automated detection and fixing is really needed to address this shortened response window and that code-based approaches improve significantly over approaches that rely on metadata. That is concluding my first part. I'm running, I'm running a little bit of time. Let's see if I make it. The second part is on supply chain attacks. And I would like to start this with a nice quote from, uh, yeah, from a security researcher saying that installing code from a package manager has the same level of security as curl site com bash. And what I like about the quote is that it nicely illustrates the dilemma of many developers, including myself. If I come across, or if somebody tells me I should fetch whatever web page and execute it in my terminal, I would, I would become suspicious at, or I would ask me some questions, maybe have a look at the script. But in developer mode, when I want to get things done and develop stuff, I have, there's much less hesitation to just install, to run npm install or pip install or what else uh, command. And why is that so dangerous? Is that uh, many packages or ecosystems come with the pre and post installation scripts. So if you install a package, there is some script being executed with your user on your computer. And not only of the package that you install, but for all the packages that this package depends on. So all the upstream packages. So you happen to execute quite some stuff on your computer or potentially if you, uh, if you install a package. Um, this, the former quote was from somebody who developed a proof of, con uh, proof of concept warm for the NPM ecosystem that would re replicate itself. This year is a real example from November 2018, which gained quite some attention because of the number, high number of downloads, and the high number of packages that depended on this package event stream. What happened is the alleged attacker wrote an email to the original developer and asked whether he could end, whether he would like to hand over the ownership. And the original developer who lost interest in the open source project kind of agreed, which you know opened all possibilities to the attacker. And, and this example is also noteworthy because uh, the attack was relatively sophisticated compared to previous ones. So the malicious payload was encrypted and the payload only triggered for certain downstream packages and it would it evaded detection by only by by only running in productive environments and evading its execution in test environments or build environments. 
um, there is an increasing number of such attacks. And this is work we have done together with the University of Bonn. So here we looked at 174 malicious packages for which we could obtain the actual code. And so we were looking at the malicious code. And, um, uh, and we looked at the different um, dimensions um, and problems. So when would it, under which, under which conditions would it trigger? How did the attacker injected the malicious package into somebody's dependency tree and so forth? and as well as temporal aspects. And here there's a clear trend for an increase in number. Uh, in 2019, in particular, there was a, uh, a bigger campaign on Ruby gems. And on the right hand side, you see the average or the, 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 the number of days that malicious packages were available in the different ecosystems. And I think an average a malicious package was like 209 days or so available before it was discovered and yanked from the repository. This is an attack tree, which is far too detailed to go, to, to go through all the nodes and the attack vectors. Um, I just wanted to highlight two things. The most important attack vectors are typo squatting. So here you, this is a technique from domain squatting applied to open source ecosystems. So you would basically choose, the attacker would choose a name similar to a well-known name. And my favorite example is a malicious package called MumPy instead of NumPy, this uh, Python uh, library for machine learning. And the second most important vector was the use of weak compromised credentials. So basically package maintainers had weak passwords they were stolen and the attackers uploaded malicious packages to PyPy, NPM and so forth. Event stream was a matter of social engineering. The two ingredients that make supply chain attacks so, let's say, possible are kind of the trust that users, developers have in packages um, and at the same time, the automation introduced by build systems such as Maven that care about dependency resolution and installation and download in an automated fashion. Again, you run, you install one package and the likelihood of installing another 50, 100 packages is not that small. Um, I think I just have five minutes, so maybe I hurry up a little bit. Um, uh, actually, I should probably go to the conclusions already um, of, of this section in order to not uh, go too much over time. So there is a, a number of consideration related to trust, uh, the implicit trust in the ecosystem. Um, um, but I think I, I really go to the conclusions here. And as again, as before, you're invited to go through the slides and contact me for all the details. So here basically is um, the takeaways is many people thank you for putting trust in their security capabilities. And one of the examples I was skipping was showing how weak, weekly package maintainers use passwords. And so, uh, and, and, and put entire ecosystems at risk. The reason of the increase of supply chain attacks is that there are many, the, the, the number of dependencies of projects increased so much over the time. And so did the number of actors and the complexity of the build processes and the related infrastructures, which all resulted in a considerable attack surface. There is this notable, noticeable increase in supply chain attacks. And in particular, Python, Node.js, and Ruby are the primary targets. I suspect the former two ones in particular because of the presence of these installation scripts and installation hooks. But, uh, but maybe we just don't know. A few ecosystems like Java, Maven Central, to my knowledge, have not been analyzed in a systematic fashion. And if you want to protect against malicious open source components, the two takeaways for me are that all dependency methods, not only the compile or runtime dependencies, but also the test dependencies or the, all the build plugins that you have, because all of that is executed when you compile and build 
and test your solution and could possibly modify the compiled code that ends up on a package repository. And if ever you're going to review open source projects because you're kind of security sensitive and want to know what you're using, it doesn't bring much to look at the source code repository. You should really only look at what you download, which is sometimes ugly if it is for compiled languages, but looking at the source code will not help you against detecting supply chain attacks. Known vulnerabilities, accidental vulnerabilities, but no supply chain attacks. It is an active search of an active field of research, um, which hopefully will yield some results in the near future that then will become integrated in the different uh, toolings and different stakeholders or by the different stakeholders. A few closing remarks, and I'm really sorry that I had to rush a little bit. Uh, I hope still my main message has got through. Um, what is missing really in terms of supply chain attacks is that there is there's no comprehensive and comparative study of the effectiveness of different safeguards in the different ecosystems and then a subsequent gap analyst so kind of have best practices and tips and tricks here and there but we don't have really some um, a good study of how much that is that is solving the problem um, I have a couple of selective and opinionated uh, or an opinionated list of technical safeguards. I didn't want to go into organizational safeguards, safeguards such as training, awareness and so forth, but I'm more into, into the technical stuff. Um, but before showing those, I wanted to mention a few things. One particular, and this goes to all, especially the commercial users, I think they deserve more support both the upstream project used by commercial vendors as well as the infrastructure providers. And a good example is PyPy, which is run by as few as 10 administrators for more than 450,000 package owners and more than 260,000 projects. And there is no surprise that these few people struggle to fix and run after security issues. Um, out of scope of this presentation are very interesting topics, maybe not to work on, but to follow from the distance. One is a number of government regulations and standards that will be imposed in the near future on um, software development organizations. An interesting topic always is liability of co commercial software vendors. I mean, for all the open source providers, we have our open source licenses solving the problem in terms of legal liability. But for commercial software vendors, this is, this is a dedicated topic. And then there's also this, this topic of moral responsibility. And this became apparent in this event stream example I was showing before. He had an open source license. He was fined from the legal side, denying all liability for however the project is used. But there was a huge debate by in the, in the issue where they discussed the problem and one some people basically said, you should have taken care. You cannot just hand over the project to anybody. How could you do this? And there were other people, including the developer who handed over the project saying, well, I, this is, this is a, a spare time activity investing, I'm investing hours and days and, um, and this could be not demanded from him. So I find this a very interesting discussion and open problem if, if you, if you want. Um, Right, and this is this is a list of uh, safeguards. The upper part is just standard stuff, uh, well known, relatively cheap, mostly that should be applied where possible. I find the lower ones more interesting, um, and you don't see the upper parts because I didn't want you to read through all those. The lower ones are more interesting because they address the problem, one of the big problems, um, which is that the builds of open source projects happen on arbitrary system. So very often it's the, some build systems or even developer machines where the binary package is produced that will be uploaded to PyPy or to Maven Central or to where else. And this, this, is, this is a huge problem. And this is addressed by these three first uh, mitigations all from a different angle. And the, the last topic I wanted to put this 
because there are um, ongoing research works that suggest that the whole attack surface, or that, or let me start differently, that uh, a good portion of the open source components that you pull into your project is actually not needed by your specific application. And so you can just slice it away in order to reduce the attack surface. And that, that is one um, technical countermeasure that personally I find very interesting and promising. And I hope there will be some research in this area soon. That is, and I was really rushing as I feared in the beginning, uh, basically my presentation. Um, yeah, sorry again for the few examples that I skipped in the supply chain attacks part, but I hope you, you got my main messages and main points. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Thank you, Henrik. Uh, not question, I think, uh, maybe, maybe during the, uh, certainly the breakout session, uh, certainly. Uh, thank you very much, because we are in a little bit in a hurry now. And uh, let's, uh, now I will give the, the stage to moderator to Rosaria and Marco to, to, to follow up on the next speech. Philippe, just to say that uh, we took notes on uh, of the questions that appeared in the chat. Uh, okay. oh, yeah, so uh, okay, our uh, our speakers will be uh, available uh, at the end of this session for a breakout. So uh, please uh, uh, join us, and uh, you can ask all the questions that you want. Thank you. Okay. Very good.